Welcome to Dr. Piercy's Building the Game Number class for our servlet-based guessing game example. In this video, we'll review the guessing game example, servlet version, and how the game number class fits in. You'll also learn how to add a Java class to a dynamic web application. In the spirit of thinking before programming, let's review the game. First, the Game Master will decide on a secret number. The player of games will then try to guess the number in a series of guesses. For each guess, the Game Master will respond with whether or not the guess is correct. If it is incorrect, the Game Master will respond if the guess is lower or higher. Eventually, the guess will be correct, and the Game Master will respond providing statistics of how the game went. To build this game for our servlet version, we'll need to make one webby component, namely index.jsp Java server page. We'll also need to make a servlet to act as the controller and view component when handling each user guess. Each of these may call on the components in the model. For our model, we'll include one Java class called game number. Note that we're actually combining both the model one and the model two Java web architectures in this example. For our very first request, we're using the Model 1 architecture where the index.jsp will serve as both the controller and the view. And then we're kind of doing the Model 2 architecture for every guess after that. And the game servlet will handle both the controller and view concerns. As I mentioned, both the index.jsp and the game servlet will have access to the game number class in the model. We'll use the game number class to represent any of the numbers that we're going to use in the game. Some of you may be thinking that this isn't necessary for our guessing game, and I would have to say that you're correct. The only reason that I'm including it is so that I can teach you how to add Java classes in a simple way to a dynamic web application. Here we see a UML class diagram for the game number. Note it's just going to hold a number as data, so I have included only one field called value, which will be an int in this case. I'm going to have two constructors, so I'm overloading the constructor. One will be a default constructor that takes no parameter, and the second will be able to pass into that constructor a particular value that we want to set it as. Since we have one field, we'll only need one pair of getters and setters, the set value and the get value. And then we're going to have a couple of other interesting methods that we'll want to create for this. One of the things we're going to need to do is have a random number we can select as the target for the guessing game. So we'll create a set random method for that one. Another number, the number of guesses that we're going to have, we'll need to increment over time. We'll need to add one to it each time there's a new guess. So let's add a method to take care of the increment. At this time, that's all I can think of as important methods that we need to add to this class. So let's start building it. So here we are back in Eclipse. You can see in the Project Explorer, the Guessing Game Servlet version project that we created in an earlier video, including the packages, controllers and model under the source folder, and note where web content is, where we will be storing our webby components. For this video, the only thing we're going to do is create and add our model class, the game number class. This is a Java resource, so we need to add it under the Java resources and under the source folder. As we mentioned when we created the project, this is where we will store any Java classes. Since our game number class is going to be considered part of the model of our architecture, we're going to store it in the model package. So start by right clicking on model, select new, and this time select Java class. Here's the only dialog page that we need to fill out for a new Java class. Note that the source folder is already shown as guessing game servlet version slash SRC and that we are already starting it in model package. Let's go ahead and add the name. Recall we are calling it game number. We'll use the standard Java syntax for a class and capitalize each word. Let's check modifiers. Let's make sure this one is public so that it may be used by components that reside in other packages. 
As for superclass, we are not going to inherit from any other class other than object, so we'll leave the superclass as is. We will not need to use any interfaces for this example. Under method stubs, let's just leave checked inherited abstract methods. We're not going to need a main in this particular class, as it will not run on its own. And since we're not inheriting from anything but object, we do not need any constructors from superclass. Finally, let's go ahead and check generate comments. Now that our dialog is complete, let's click finish. Over here in the Package Explorer, we now see that game number.java file has been added under the model package. In the editor, in the center of the perspective, we see the first bit of code for game number.java, the code that was generated based on our settings in the dialog. We have some comments. We see that the package statement is the first executable statement. It says package model. One rule for this is that any Java class, if it resides in a package, you must have the package statement, and the package statement must be the first executable line of code in your Java class definition. This means we can have comments above that statement, but we cannot have another statement that's executable. The only parts that we see generated already, then, is the stub for the class, namely public class game number. Our task will be to put all the things to define the game number between the braces. Before we get started, let's have a quick look at our UML class diagram. I'm going to start by adding the fields. Looking at our UML class diagram, we see that we only have one. It's going to be value, and it will be a data type int. In general, we usually put our fields first in our Java class. It's not required, but it's a good practice. A good practice when implementing Java encapsulation is to make sure that all your fields are private and that they can only be accessed via public getters and setters. This gives us control as the writer of the getters and setters to make sure that any data that's entered into our fields follows our rules. So after private, type int, and then the name of the variable called value. I like to write a little bit and save often, so I'm going to save this. In addition, I'm going to double click on the tab so we can just focus on the editor in Eclipse. Now that we have our single field, let's have a look at UML diagram and figure out what to work on next. One thing you should note is this diagram is basically the blueprint for our Java class. As you can see, we already created the first member, the field value, and now we're ready to work on the methods. Let's start with the constructors. Note that we're going to have two, one that takes no parameters and one that takes one parameter related to our field. Now we could actually type these constructors, but Eclipse provides us with a nice feature that's much easier. So let's create the default constructor that takes no parameters first. Click on the source menu. Note that there are a number of generate commands on the lower half of this menu generate getters and setters, delegate methods, and so on. And then there's one that says generate constructor using fields, and another that says generate constructor from superclass. As we're not inheriting from anything, we won't need that one, but it would be nice to use generate constructor using fields. Of course, you might be screaming at me now saying, Dr. Piercy, we wanted to make the default constructor. Well, we can still do that one by using generate constructor using fields, and then note we can either select all the fields or deselect all. So let's see what happens if we deselect any fields if we can still generate the constructor. As with any dialog, we need to do this carefully. So I've selected the fields, in this case none of them, that I want to have as parameters. The insertion point determines where it's going to put the code in your class. So you want to choose this so that it goes in the right place. Last member is safe, because if you do things in the order that's in our UML class diagram, we'll have things one after the other. But note, you can also say put it after the first member or after value, if you come along and add something after you've created a lot of code. We're actually going to use public for our access modifier. Some people leave off access modifiers for their constructors, but that's only good if other classes are in the same package. If we want this constructor to be available to classes that are outside of the model package, we need to include the public access modifier. Let's go ahead and generate comments. 
Remember, no inheritance, so let's omit call to default constructor. Now, since this dialog is set up as we would like, click Generate. Now you'll notice the stub for this constructor has been created. In this constructor, I am going to just set the value equal to 500, which is halfway between 0 and 1,000 for our game. Type this, then dot. Notice after you hit dot, Eclipse will show us a list of possible things to put after the dot. In this case, we want the field value from our game number. I'm going to narrow this down by hitting V. And then I'll just click on that to select it from the list, equal to 500. I just arbitrarily picked 500. You can set this value to any reasonable number that you want it to be, or even leave it off, in which case value would be by default zero. As I have a significant amount of code added, I'm going to hit save. Now let's do the same thing for our next constructor. Recall our next constructor will take in an integer that we can set to the value of our field. Let's go back to source, generate constructor using fields. This time I'm going to leave value selected. Check the insertion point, last member, check access modifier, generate constructor comments, leave checked, leave omit, checked, hit generate. And voila, we now have two overloaded constructors for our game number. One that will take no parameter and set the value to 500. The other, we can pass in a parameter that's an int and it will set the field to whatever we pass into the method. Again, hit save. Let's have another look at our UML class diagram to see what to work on next. Okay, checking our blueprint, we can already check off the first three items in the list. How about we do the getter and the setter? Set value and get value. These would be necessary if we ran the first constructor or even the second constructor and wanted to change the value after the number was set. So back in Eclipse, you might have noticed earlier that under the source menu, there was a generate for getters and setters. So let's make it easy on ourselves and use that for the next part. Source, generate getters and setters. As with the constructors, we have the opportunity to select which fields we want to make getters and setters for. In this case, we only have one field, and we do indeed want to have the getters and setters for that. But note, I can choose if I so desire to only use the getter or only use the setter. In this case, I'm just going to select all because I want to create the whole thing. I'm going to leave allow setters for final fields unchecked because I have no final fields. Insertion point, I'll leave to last member so it should come up after the last thing we created. Sort by, here we have a choice. We can, we can have our getters and setters sorted by fields, meaning they'll be pairs get value, set value. If we had another field, it would be get that field, set that field. Or we can choose to have all our getters together and then all the setters. I generally prefer to have them generated in field pairs because I usually look at the, for them together. For our access modifier, we need these to be public so the methods can be accessed from classes that reside in packages outside of the model package. And we might as well generate comments. Now that we're happy with our dialog box, let's hit generate. That was fast. Notice we have both the get value and the set value created. Let's save and check out our diagram for what's next. Checking off the list, we can now check off the set value and the get value. So next we have set random and we have increment. I think we can remember those, so I'll make this the last time we look at our diagram. But note that set random will take two integers, and we're going to use that to set our game number between the minimum value of zero and the maximum value of a thousand, but to pick a random number in there. The increment will simply take whatever the current value is and add one to it. So it should be simple to create. So let's get to it. Here we are back in Eclipse. We're going to make our set random with two ints, and we're going to make our increment method. However, these are not the kind of methods we can use source generate. These are methods that actually get the job done for our application, other than just setting values. And since that cannot be anticipated before doing it, it has to be something we design and decide on our own 
there's no way Eclipse can have generate commands to generate them for us. So as there's no easy way around this, we'll need to go ahead and type our method in. So place the cursor somewhere below the last member, in this case set value. This will be a public method, so type public. It's going to return void. This method will just change and set our field value rather than returning a value. So I'll use void. Now we can type the name of our method, set random, as it will set the value to some random value. And then we want to be able to provide it with two integers representing the minimum value in the range and the maximum value in the range. How about int minimum, good name for the lower value, and int maximum. And then let's add our braces so we can have code implementation. Now, we have to figure out how can we use these two numbers to come up with a random number between the two values. Fortunately, there's a Java class in the Java class library that we can use to help us with this. This is called the random class. So I need to first create an object of the random class. So I'm going to type random. Then I need to give my object a name. Might as well call it lowercase random. Remember, we can do this since Java is case sensitive. The big R random will represent the class, while the little r random will represent my object. We then need to do equal, new, and then I'll call the default constructor for random, semicolon. Now, you notice that an error is visible in the editor. If I hover over the error, I see that random cannot be resolved to a type. So currently, my program does not recognize the class random. Notice that there are also several quick fixes available. I need to read through those and pick the one that is the problem, or disregard them all if I feel that neither of them are the problem. In this case, I know that I need to import random from java.util. So I can either scroll back up to the top and type in import java.util.random, or I can simply click the hyperlink and note that it was entered for me on line 6. Now back in our set random method, I can now use our random object to set the value. Let's type this dot value, because that's what we're setting. And now we're going to use random. There's a nice method I know about that we can use. Let me hit dot and we'll see what list of methods there are. Notice Eclipse has provided a list of possible methods we can call. So I can look through the list, but fortunately, the one that's up at the top is pretty much the one I want to use. Let's read its description. Next int takes an integer and returns an integer. The 36% is the probability that Eclipse has figured out that this is probably what I want. This method will return a pseudo-random uniformly distributed int value between zero and it includes zero, and the specified value. So it doesn't include the value at the top. Drawn from this random number generator sequence, the general contract of next int is that one int value in the specified range is pseudo-randomly generated and returned. I think that's enough to read. It looks like this is going to do the job for me. Let's select that one. Now we need to put a bound. What is our maximum? Well, we already have a maximum variable, which means the top end. So if I use that variable, currently the method would return a random number between zero and maximum, but it does not include maximum. If I want maximum to be a possible random value, I need to add plus one here. So, so for example, if minimum is zero and maximum is a thousand, at this point we'd get a number somewhere between zero and a thousand and one, but not including a thousand and one. So it includes a thousand. To be safe though, what if we do not set minimum to zero? We're, we're going to need to start at a particular number. So let's say we wanted to go from, for example, five to 10. We can put plus minimum. What would that give us? That would give us a number between zero and 11, and then add five to it which works pretty good if the numbers one, two, three, or 
4, it adds 5 to it, 0 through 4, and 5. But once we get to 6, that's going to be too high. So what else could we do? Well, one thing we could do is make sure that our upper bound, the random part of this expression, is only through the range we want. So what if we did this? Maximum minus minimum plus 1. So let's say minimum is 5 and maximum is 10. Maximum minus minimum will get us to 5 again plus 1. So we're going to get numbers between 0 and 5 for the random part and then we'll add 5 again. So if we get 0 plus 5 is 5, if we get 1 plus 5 is 6 and so forth. So here's a pretty good formula that lets us get between whatever range of minimum and maximum is. Not just 0 to the maximum but from minimum to maximum when minimum is not zero. So I think that's a good one. Of course I would test this later to make sure it gives us appropriate values. Probably a good idea to add a comment describing what this method does. It selects a random integer between the values of minimum and maximum. Okay, let's hit save, and we just need to add our final method, increment. Let's go ahead and do this in the right way this time. I should have written a comment first, although notice by doing it last, it put in the parameter for me. This one is going to increment the field value by 1. This will be a very simple one. As before, this one needs to be public. It won't return anything, it will just adjust the field value, so void. Type the name of the method, which is increment. We will not need to pass any parameters. So the only thing we need to do is then this dot value plus plus. Recall the plus plus takes the value as it is and adds one to it. Now in our design, we've got all the methods we're going to need to run the guessing game. So let's review what we have. We have our game number. We have one field called value, or we've overloaded our constructor, one that takes no parameter and sets game number to 500 for the value, and the other one that will take one parameter and will set the field to whatever that value happens to be. For our field, we have a getter and a setter, so we can change the value of the field by using one of these, or we can just simply read the value of the field. We have a method that we felt would be interesting for our program that will give us a random number in between the values of minimum and maximum. And we have another method that will take whatever the field is and will add one to it. So it increments that value. So I believe our game number class is complete. We'll see how this can be used along with our other project components in later videos. For more information related to the concepts in this video, please visit the references shown here. This video was written, narrated, and produced by Dr. Craig A. Piercy. This has been a Piercy production.